Hello everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be one of those exceptional cases in which it doesn't fit into any of the three categories because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful praying mantis. This episode is, of course, a very, very special listener episode dedicated to four of you very special listeners out there. It is dedicated to Samantha, Sylvia, Margaret, and someone who wrote in under the pseudonym of Moo Man, which is a great name. What is amazing is that all four of these special listeners probably are not in the same continent. They're listening to this podcast from thousands of miles away, but all of them wrote into the show wanting to learn about this super cool animal. So thank you for the wonderful suggestion, and I hope you enjoy your episode. If you want to request an animal, you can do so by sending a message to Relax with Animal Facts on Instagram. You can also send a message on the relaxwithanimalfacts.com website, where you can also check out blogs and other sorts of things like that. You can also send a message or an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. Your requests are what make this show possible, and the show has been running on requests ever since the first few episodes, and for that, I am so grateful. Let's just say where we got our facts from, so we can go straight into the meat of what exactly is a praying mantis. I got my facts from nationalgeographic.com, facts.net, and almanac.com. All three of these resources made this episode possible, and so I am going to put all of them in the show notes or the description of this episode, as we always do. I encourage you all to go check them out. They each have so much to learn on their websites. And now I would like for all of you to notice maybe where you are carrying some tension. One thing that you might notice, especially if you are listening to this with somebody is that everybody carries tension a different way. Some people's shoulders go straight to their ears like they're some kind of organic headphones. Some will clench their jaw or clench their hands all the time. Everybody is truly different, and in my case today, it is in my hands as it always is. And so I would encourage all of you to do your best in relaxing whatever it is that is tense for you as we go into this immersive experience with me, Steph Wolf, into the grasslands where the praying mantis resides. The praying mantis is an insect that many of us are likely familiar with. We maybe have even had them land on top of us while we are walking around in the field somewhere or even in our backyards. But when it comes to some of those amazing characteristics about the praying mantis, they may have been a mystery for you until now. Let's start with some basic things about the praying mantis so we can better build off of that foundation. Its common name is of course the praying mantis, while its scientific name is mantis religiosa. And that second distinction may sound very familiar to something that we have in English, and that is part of the etymology that we are going to leave until later. The praying mantis is, of course, an invertebrate, and before I go any farther, I think it is good to define our terms here. So many times, these lofty scientists and researchers will throw around words like vertebrate and invertebrate, but if we don't have a firm grasp of exactly what those terms mean, they kind of go over our heads. 
So the term invertebrate refers to a cold-blooded animal that does not have a backbone. Along with not having a backbone, their diet is going to consist of purely carnivorous material. They don't eat their vegetables, but will prefer a strictly carnivorous diet of other insects and animals. Each one is going to live about a year in the wild. I especially appreciate the side-by-side -side of the praying mantis to the teacup. They are very close to one another, so if you have a teacup in your hands, of course not a huge mug, but a little teacup, you have a general context by which you can tell how tall and how wide the praying mantis is on average. The praying mantis is named for its prominent front legs, which are bent and held together at an angle that suggests the position of prayer. The reason I am not saving this until the end like we normally do is because we are going to be covering the etymology of the word mantis instead. So if we remember back to the beginning where we learned about the scientific name, mantis religiosa. Religiosa is one of those root words that we use in English as religion. So we can see how apt the name praying mantis is. You need only open up a picture of this wonderful creature and see just how it sits in a resting position. And we can understand why they were given this special distinction. One thing that might be important to clear up is that some articles will throw around mantis, others will say mantid. What exactly is the difference? Well, when we say mantis as a term, this refers only to members of the genus mantis. That would include, for example, the European mantis, which is again mantis religiosa, but the term mantid with a D at the end refers to all and any species, but they are used essentially interchangeably by many of the scientific community and many of the articles that you are going to read online. So mantid is going to refer to the entire group of an order of insects known as mantodia, and this is a term that describes insects that look as if they are praying when their front legs are held at rest. So I hope that is helpful in navigating the terrain of articles and not getting confused. But at the time of this recording, there are around 1,800 species of praying mantis alive on the planet. They are considered to be of least concern, meaning they are flourishing wherever they are and their population is nice and stable. Now, the praying mantis as a whole will have five eyes, six legs, two antennae, and a triangular head. Now, I can put a lot of things on my resume to make me look super unique. What I can't do is say that I have five eyes and six legs and a triangular head. The mantis would undoubtedly get the job over me. But this just shows how unique this creature is, and even our small little insect friends are ones that have tremendous capacity to be so utterly peculiar and special that they can cause in us a sense of admiration and wonder. Now this triangular head that they have will be poised on this very long neck. The people wearing the white coats might just call that neck an elongated thorax, but they can turn these triangular heads almost on a swivel and they can turn around 180 degrees to scan their surroundings with their two large compound eyes along with the three other simple eyes located between them. So again, we have terminology that needs to be defined here. When I say compound eyes and simple eyes, what exactly is that referring to? 
A compound eye means that there are multiple lenses involved in the seeing process. In the simple eye, a single lens is going to collect all of that information and focus the light onto the retina of the eye. So the difference lies in the amount of lenses. So while the compound eye comes in clusters of these lenses, the simple eye will only have that single one. So let's take count here. The praying mantis has two large compound eyes that each have multiple lenses, while the other three simple eyes only have single lenses. That all results in the praying mantis having some pretty astonishing vision. And the general colors in which you are going to see them are green and brown, though not always. They are typically green and brown, which will allow them to camouflage very well onto the plants among which they live. They can blend into their surroundings like the ambush predators that they are, and when prey comes just a little bit too close, they can use their two front legs accompanied by their intense reflexes, and that prey is dinner. Their reflexes are so quick that they are difficult to see with the naked eye. It is much easier to see with some technological equipment like a camera that can slow down and so you can see just how fast they lunge onto their prey. So just adding to their resume, not only do they have a bunch of eyes, some more complex than others, a triangular head, and a bunch of legs, but they can also take to the air. Most praying mantids are able to fly, although some females might not be able to, but that seems to be on a more case-by-case -case or mantis-to-mantis -mantis basis. So the praying mantis, because it is alive for an average of one year, they will usually only last from the months that cover spring until fall. That means that a praying mantis is an adult for about six months of its life. But that will be plenty time to eat a plenty, to breed, and to do all of the other mantis-like things that they like doing. So we know that they can turn their heads about 180 degrees, that is half a circle, so it can turn completely from front to back, along with all of those eyes, it gives them a 300 degree field of vision. With the sensitivity of those complex eyes, they can spot the slightest movement from up to 60 feet away. Me, without my glasses, I would have a hard time spotting someone doing jumping jacks 5 feet away. And so I will give the praying mantis the pedestal on that one as well. Now those signature arms that it has, which are in that prayer position when they are at rest, but quickly become the instrument to its prey's doom, those arms are called raptorial forelegs, which is an awesome name. These are the appendages by which it can latch on as they have these little spikes for grip lining all alongside them, and this makes them a formidable predator. But don't worry, while they may be quite a threat in the smaller scale insect world, you and me, we have nothing to fear. Though I probably wouldn't be placing my little pinky finger anywhere near them, but that is up to everyone's judgment. So as a carnivore, the praying mantis is going to eat other insects. That will include flies, crickets, moths, and even grasshoppers. Now because the praying mantis is still pretty small, about the size of a teacup, they will have their share of natural predation as well. So the praying mantis is going to have to camouflage itself very well to hide from bats, frogs, birds, monkeys, snakes, and spiders. 
While the praying mantis is a formidable predator, it is by no means the apex predator of its environment. The praying mantis is, of course, going to have to be careful of its natural predators, but it is also susceptible to a different sort of predation. I think one of the most well-known fact about the praying mantis is this unfortunate breeding or mating behavior that happens within the praying mantis species, in which the adult female sometimes will eat her mate just after or perhaps even during mating. Apart from this terrifying reality, the males are not at all deterred, and that is why we can consider this population to be of least concern. So the males walk into this with their head held up high and willing to take the risk that the female might be a little hungry. So after this potentially horrifying ordeal, the females will regularly lay hundreds of eggs in a very small case, and the baby praying mantises, which are known as nymphs, will hatch, looking much like tiny versions of their parents, ready immediately to start eating on insects, and they have six months until they become adults to have kids of their own. What a strange and amazing ordeal. We know that spiders and other sorts of animals have some of that similar behavior. It is most often seen in insect species from what I understand. But if there is an exception to that rule and anyone knows it, please reach out and let me know. Two pretty cool facts fall into the folklore category. And by that, I mean that the culture or society adopts some sort of interesting view about something or about some particular animal. And in the case of the French, they had once thought that a praying mantis would point a lost child home. Now, understanding their impeccable eyesight, this one would be almost believable. This is a sweeter take on the praying mantis than many other folklores will have about other animals. Sometimes animals are displayed as tricksters or something of the like. But here in the French folklore, it doesn't say the exact time. I imagine it must have been some time ago. But we can see from this little tale that the French must have thought quite well about the praying mantis. In some parts of Africa, it is considered good luck if one of the praying mantises happens to land on you. And so here we have another beneficial folklore story about the praying mantis. So it seems as though their reputation is a high one. Let's move on to the final fact of the episode, which is the name. We already found out why the praying mantis is called the praying mantis, but what does that word mantis mean? The word mantis comes from the Greek word mantikos, which means soothsayer or prophet. And the coinage of the term mantis as a type of insect that holds its forelegs in a praying position was really solidified in the 1650s. Another animal which is a great future episode is the mantis shrimp, and it will have this same sort of position. So from these things, we can see that the praying mantis is an animal that has always drawn a lot of admiration and a lot of looks, but I am sure that they have been the recipient of so much admiration and inquiry hundreds of years before the 1650s. We are now going to move on to the review portion of the show. This is where I read a user-submitted review, typically on Apple Podcasts, and this was written by LoopyLoo502 and was written all the way from Great Britain. And Loopy Lou 502 writes, Have listened to this podcast nearly every night for over a year. 
The idea is so simple, but it is so relaxing listening to animal facts delivered in such a palatable way. Thank you for helping me to drift off each night and for enabling me to drop some facts in here and there during the day and making me look smart. Loopy Lou, it is all my pleasure to provide you with that intellectual ammunition in which you can share your animal facts knowledge with somebody else. Thank you for your very kind and wonderful review. I am so grateful that the show can be of help to you and is part of your nightly routine as it is for many of you. If you want to leave a review like Loopy Lou 502 did, you are encouraged to do so as it is one of the main ways that you can help support the show. But you joining me here every week is gift enough. Thank you all for listening to this podcast episode. If you want to learn about an animal that you find to be super, super cool, make sure to write in to either the Instagram Relax With Animal Facts or you can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and go to the Animal Request tab. And lastly, you can always send an email directly to Relax With Animal Facts at gmail.com. A reminder for those of you who have sent an email and possibly did not get a reply, sometimes emails slip through the cracks and I don't see them or I don't notice them. And so if you have not gotten a reply, please send it again. You guys never leave me hanging each week and so I want to make sure that I don't leave you hanging either. Thank you all again for joining me on this wonderful adventure where we learned about the praying mantis and I hope that you will join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.